How you doing today? I'm wonderful, 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 wonderful. I'm so excited we're doing this. Oh, well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Your background is really diverse um, and really unique as a realtor. You've been able to make both a personal brand and what I call like a property successful brand, right? So you're focused on both being great for your clients, but also representing yourself. So I thought I'd ask first how you got started in real estate and kind of what made you passionate about this industry. But I would really like to learn about how you became this remarkable person. See how I did that? You did that. You did um, that. <laughs> truly, truly remarkable when it comes to like understanding your personal brand and how it relates to your property marketing. So we go and get there, but tell me a little bit about how you got started. So I actually purchased my first property at the age of 24. And I wouldn't say I purchased it. The property was in a uh, land trust to my irrevocable land trust to my mother. Nice. The property was in my grandfather's name, but it was my mother's building because it is it was my mother's father in law who financed the building. Oh. So my mother was clear about how she wanted things to go if anything ever happened to him. So her putting the property in an irrevocable trust was probably no, it wasn't probably it was the absolute best thing. Yeah. So in 2000, no, actually in 1994, my grandfather sold me the property, but because it was an irrevocable land trust and mm -hmm. only I think four states have them, my mother had to sign off on him selling me her building. That was first and foremost. Wow. So I was 24. I had this building. I had uh, done a couple of refinances. But in 1999, I went through a bitter lawsuit with my family. My family owns Chicago's second oldest Black restaurant. We've been in business since 1954. I was born and raised an entrepreneur. Wow. Um, and I own the trademark right for lambs. And my aunt felt as though I should just give it to them. And I didn't. So they sued me and I had to counter sue them and they had to buy me out. The judge wouldn't listen to the lawsuit, forced us to go to mediation, but I'd already come into real estate. So when I initially got the, the lawsuit, it was a whole ordeal about keys to the restaurant and essentially how they would manage me coming and going. So on my 29th birthday, I gave them the keys. I wow. said, you don't have, you won't be managing me and take your keys, right? And mm -hmm. I said, okay, now, now you put your big girl panties on. How are you going to provide for you and your son? Yeah. There was a d gentleman by the name of Dennis. Dennis was my loan originator. My first mortgage was through a program called IDA, which oh. was a special finance program. I said, ooh, I like what Dennis does. I'm going to go be a loan originator. And the barriers to entry in 1999, there weren't any barriers to entry. Really? There, there was no license, yeah. not here in the state of Illinois. There was no fingerprints. There was no criminal background check. Wow. There was nothing. You so, know, that makes sense. Seven years after that, I bought my first property and the barrier was quite low. So I didn't even think about that even just a few years prior. It was a perfect storm. <laughs> 1999, if you wanted to originate a loan, you found somebody to work for and you originated loan. So I go and I work with Dennis and I still see my first boss till this day. She's in the title side of the business now. Oh. Well, I've always prided myself on education. So before I ever came in to real estate, I already had an undergrad and a master's degree and had taught on a collegiate level. Mm -hmm. I'd already had designations and licenses in the hospitality industry. Yeah. So when I came into real estate, uh, as a loan originator, there was what they called uh, the, the certified mortgage specialist. It wasn't a CMS. It was the certified residential mortgage specialist. There mm -hmm. was one gentleman of color. Hey, Maurice Rao. So Maurice Rao, he had this certified residential mortgage specialist. Mm -hmm. I met him at the Illinois Mortgage Brokers Conference. I said, mm, he got the highest credentials in this industry. I need to go work with him. Yeah. And a week later, I was working with him and became a sales manager within a year, then decided I wanted to go and uh, work for other companies, earned my real estate license in uh, 2002, didn't do anything with it. I was in this very small group of people mm -hmm. that if you have an undergrad or a master's degree in business, you could just sit for the exam. And that's what I did. And I passed Ooh. the first time. But here's the disaster, right? I didn't know nothing. So 
So I've always been a licensed broker and I decided to hold my own license. And let me be clear with you. I didn't know anything. Now, fast forward today, I have 64 real estate related licenses, designations and certifications. I can teach continuing education in every single state in the country. Cool. Me transitioning from loan originator to real estate broker was a matter of the numbers. I was sitting down. I was going over my business plan. I looked at uh, how many loans I would need to originate, realized that to earn what I wanted to earn, I would have to do about 140 transactions. Didn't realize when I would ever see my child because I was an unwedded mother. And I said, "Mm, if I open a real estate broker company, I don't have to do as many transactions. I could get away with about 70. And guess what? My first year as a realtor, I did $12 million in volume. I closed just, look, just about 70 transactions. Um, But I knew that I was here to stay. Yeah. So that's, so it was, how was I going to earn an above average income and feel like a stay at home mom as a unwedded mother? This is so helpful, actually, when I think about, the journey of most entrepreneurs, because you nailed this, right? Like my background was in business well before it was in real estate design. And the thing is, if we treat real estate as a business, it's actually not an accident who becomes successful. (laughs) I think it's positioned as this like, Um, who's who of who can be successful in real estate. And every time I get to know a successful, thriving broker, realtor, educator, there's always a passion for excellence, a hunger for knowledge that started well before the industry and did not die as they were in the industry. But they also became very entrepreneurial pretty early on, maybe after a difficult time. You you nailed all three of those. You are the perfect prototype. (laughs) Oh, wow. Yes. I, I, uh, commit myself to being a lifelong learner, but a friend of mine, Monica Neubauer, she's also a fellow instructor and author. She used the word last week, a big learner. So not only am I committed to this for life, I'm a big learner. Yeah. You know, I'm always excited. Like it just, oh, it thrills me. Yeah. We're quite similar that way. No, I get, I get excited, right? I don't, I don't need anyone to be excited. If I learn something new, I'm excited all by myself. And people sometimes don't even know what I'm excited about. The men in my house, they come and look in the door because I'm in here clapping in the middle. Yes, I'm just up in here like this. Yes, come through, Marky. And they come look and they're like, really? What's going on today? Hey, I just figured something out, boo. Just woohoo! I just figured it out. enjoying it over here. (laughs) So that, you know, it really does set you apart. I'm not just saying this because we're having a conversation, but it really does set you to be a top agent instantly, a top broker instantly. When you have that vision of success that you're willing to execute on, can you remember the time where you went from I'm going to market properties to I'm going to position myself and your personal brand? Do you remember that moment and like why you made that decision? I think I always, I always had that mindset. And here's the reason why. There was this, I was teaching on a collegiate level. My family asked me to come back into the restaurant business. When I came back into the restaurant business, I increased our store sales. So we had two locations. I increased our store sales by 58% in 12 months. I had a clear, (laughs) I I had a, yes, I can. I had a clear marketing strategy. It was built on a legacy. And the fact that, and I think our sign said a family tradition for over 75 years. That was, and I had um, these little stands, eight foot by four foot that stood on the street. And then people have been asking for fish because everybody doesn't eat pork. And we did a fish fry and we launched it on a Friday. And I had some very popular Chicago DJs, Mm -hmm. Ramonski Love and Tornado. They came, but I also bartered with the radio stations this I'm telling all my secrets I bartered with the radio station for airtime and I sponsored I was the food sponsor for their events now Mm -hmm. for me if I'm looking at my food cost I was getting substantially more value in a barter system than if I had paid for it so I was going to they called it soul food Sunday and then they would throw this party at this popular club called uh, the cotton club and I was showing up on soul food Sunday feeding them on air so I would get a little air time and then I was showing up that Thursday sponsoring the food at the cotton club and so I had a lot of publicity and I was willing to barter 
for that publicity. Yeah. But the bottom line was my cost had been reduced. I went in and negotiated. My grandfather was pissed. I tell you this. <laughs> I went back to every vendor we had ever done business with. Some of these vendors, my grandfather had done business with as long as I was old. And I negotiated with them. I took a day off work and I went to everybody who provided brown paper bags and Mm -hmm. I did their pricing strategy. And I came back to the people we did business with. Mm -hmm. And I said, look, this is the new pricing you need to give us or I need to switch vendors. And they all call my granddaddy. Who this girl thinks she is coming up in here? My granddad's like, Marky, these are established relationships. I said, yeah, but they're not giving you the best price. Yeah. So if that relationship is as good as you profess it to be, and you've been doing business with them since 1954, wow. they need to give us a better price. That's so good. So uh, I made an agreement that I wouldn't do it anymore without discussing it with him first, but we all got better pricing. Yeah. So you looked at value. It sounds like if I if I were to take away something that I love to do as well as to look at best practices in some other industries outside of real estate, outside of building and apply them in this industry, sounds like value was the thing that you were focused on, not just like top line costs. And I think that's a big miss a lot of times, especially in an industry where you could argue sometimes margins are large, sometimes margins are small, sometimes the market's high, sometimes the market's low, but value is the thing that never goes away that matters and is permanent through the highest market, the bubble, and also through the difficult times. And so your focus has always been value-driven first. Did I get that right? I would say value-driven, um, but I do focus on everything. So I focus on cost of goods. So because that's what I was taught in the restaurant business, yeah. I look at my food cost. I look at my labor cost. Um, and in in the midst of being in the restaurant business, I interned at Marriott Corporation. I interned, uh, actually, I didn't intern. I was a marketing uh, sales manager at Checkers International. So what I had decided to do early was because we are essentially a small business Mm -hmm. uh, here on the south side of the city of Chicago, we've just sold more pork rib tips than anybody else. I was intentional about going and working for bigger corporations to see what the strategy was and how I could make the family business better. Wow. Okay. You just nailed even the thought process of someone who's watching this, who's maybe, uh, you know, a low man on the totem pole at this point of their career, um, whether it's in real estate, maybe they work for a builder, maybe they're fixing and flipping. You were intentional about learning the best practices from the people who were already more successful and who had a different vision of success and brought those back to exactly where you wanted to grow. That's massive. Yeah. That's a huge part of anyone's next plan. Even if there are things that are out of your control, there's always that that's in your control. Be value driven and be intentional about what you want to bring to the table, what you want to learn and how you want to differentiate. How did you know social media was like the next you know, step for you with your personal brand? When did you get to that um, realization and what was really the purpose? Well, let me be clear. So I'm 51. So I was not born and or raised with technology. Right. Um, n- not, yes. And I don't even consider myself a tech person yeah. now. But let me say this. If it was not for Freddie Taylor, Uh, who owned Urban Intellectuals, and also uh, Anita Clinton, who owned Be Great Ministries, it was them consistently telling me, you know, you need to use this. Girl, this is the next best thing. You better use this. And what's funny is uh, Freddie Taylor just inboxed me the other day. They encouraged me. But why did I really do it? It's two reasons. I was reading the then 2006 profile of buyers. I did say 2006 Mm -hmm. profile of buyers and sellers from the National Association of Realtors. Mm -hmm. It stated that in 1995, 2% of buyers were utilizing the the internet as an information source. However, in 2006, that number was 80%. Today, it's 97%. Whoa. So I'm looking at this number. I'm like, that's a 78% increase. That's a now, massive at, difference. Yes. And at that time, I had my automobile wrapped. I had bus benches, billboards, wow. direct mail. Like I was spending a lot of money on marketing and advertising. Yeah. And for me, it's when you get that first lead. Or you can say, as a result of this transaction, it's because I, d- I posted something on Facebook. Right. Instantly, I was like, oh, this is it. So that was part of it. The mm-hmm. next part was that my husband had the unmitigated gall to tell me that they would not pay me 
to teach social media. Wow. And I believe that my husband has absolute faith in me, but my husband still till this day believes that Facebook is the work of the devil. Okay. <laughs> I don't um, disagree. <laughs> right. He believes that's what he, he does not have a Facebook account and that is his firm belief. So my husband didn't believe in Facebook. And I yeah. just need you to think about that. Right. And so I was determined that I was going to, I'm going to make an above average income day. And I told my husband, they're going to pay me a lot of money to teach them right. how to use this platform. So on occasion, we joke at home and I tell him, how does mama get paid, baby? Tell mama how she get paid. Because it's a joke at this point, right? Um, because You're he had no faith. <laughs> yeah, he had no faith um, in the system. So yeah. I started using social media and technology in yeah. 2006. And it really helped me to reposition myself at that time as the queen of foreclosures. And I mean, I've been featured in Forbes, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, ABC, CBS, NBC. Like I was in the media a lot Mm -hmm. because I was on the board of directors at that time. And look, I'm again now of the Chicago Association of Realtors. Plus, Mm -hmm. I worked for a company that no longer exists, which is Rubloff. And so Mm -hmm. they were pitching me all the time. So I had a lot of publicity. And I then enhanced that with social media and technology. And in 2012, I was worn out from foreclosures and short sales and decided that I was going to pivot 100% to the education space, Mm -hmm. and that I would only focus on social media and technology for realtors. Wow. And look at me. The rest is history. Almost 10 years later. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like, you know, it's funny. People always say like, I couldn't have foreseen things happening the way that it did. I like you absolutely foresee it. I don't know that I knew the timing. I don't know if I knew there was going to be a special year where the world would completely shut down and go digital. I don't know that I could say I predicted that, but you know, 20 years ago when I started on the marketing and the sales side of this business, I remember seeing so many inefficiencies. Just I had a background in Six Sigma, which is like total operational effectiveness and always trying to make sure that things were if not just efficient, but at their very best. And I remember thinking there's so much in the real estate industry that's just wasteful from marketing spend to paperwork to just not a great client experience. And I've watched what people think social media did it did not do. What technology allowed social media to do was to make technology more democratized so that it was no longer odd to ask a client to do a DocuSign because they were a little more tech savvy than they were a decade or two ago. And I think social media, it was really the beginning of the tech revolution. You you really nailed it when you said, I looked at Facebook and I went, I'm going to make a lot of money doing this. And it wasn't necessarily directly Facebook, I'm willing to believe, but it's all the other aspects of technology that just kind of like jumped on the back of this opportunity to, I think, spread our message and to reach people in a different way. And that's one thing I talk a lot of smack about social media myself, but one thing I agree and disagree with your husband on is at the end of the day, it is the best way to own your message. So all the press in the world, does not allow you to have clarity and actual, um, I would say, uh, control over your message. So you could be featured like you and I in large media all day long, but what social media does is it just adds to that feature and to that information and gives you a chance to fully control what's said about you. I think that's where you've totally crushed it to your point. You've leveraged what is traditional media and you've taken it and kind of blown it up alongside your personal brand. Would you say, I'd love to get your real talk on this. Do you think most realtors are doing it right or are they doing it backwards where they're kind of focused on vanity metrics and not really focused on having a voice and having some authenticity on social these days? Um, oh, wow, okay. Um, I I listen to other people's panels. I think most get it wrong. Um, The very first thing is that people don't want to share anything personal about themselves. However, people do business with people who they know, like, and trust. So true. I say that all the time. I could not agree more. I had a very direct conversation that was clarified for me this past week. I thought that I had a Facebook live video that had raised over $50,000 for the 77, which is the diversity committee of the Chicago Association of Realtors. Mm -hmm. 
the CEO, Michelle Mills Clement, she actually spoke at the Realtor Conference and Expo and had a panel on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how we've done it at our association and two of the bigger brokerages in the Chicago area. Mm -hmm. And she clarified that the video actually raised over $80,000. Now, mm -hmm. That was from 450 donors globally because they knew me because I'm the only person who had the link to raise the money. Right. Um, and I called her and I asked her to create the link because I said, look, I, I am about to lose my mind. So I did a, a plea, a call to action to please help the city of Chicago in mm -hmm. the midst of the pandemic with social unrest due to the riots and looting that occurred here, especially on the south and west side of the city of yeah, Chicago. Absolutely. So people are vested because I tell I tell the story, yeah. right? Um, we all know the person who comes over to social media because they need some attention. Exactly. We know the person who's newly single, you know, and they put them girls up in the air, and this is all about every post that they make. We know that because we understand at this point we're good and grown, right? right. So we understand human behavior. I, I don't think that that's going to serve your business well. And one thing was that I added a new line of business roughly 12 months ago. And I made a post the other day that that new line of business has generated 174,000, I think 958. Wow. With no ad spend. Wow. All because of social media and technology. But there was one component that most people don't get. That's the ability to be vulnerable. Yeah. And it's they're not true. bringing that in. Here's the next problem I see. No one is creating content and you with the new Gucci handbag is not content. Thank you. Oh, so that just did, dropped that mic right now. Girl. I got you on that one. <laughs> right. So um, they don't have any content. Yeah. Right. I, I have too much content because I'm forever interviewing someone yeah. to teach something, someone something new. And I have a blog post, I have videos, I have podcasts. And honestly, I don't think in any of them, do you see, uh, you don't see a Gucci person, none of them. What you do see is maybe some Louis Vuitton earrings or something, because I wear earrings all the time, right? But no, it's about providing value. It's about being that uh, trusted leader in your marketplace. So let me tell you what happens. And I tell people this all the time. I made a post yesterday. I'm go actually going to pull this picture up. So I'm in the grocery store. Gentleman walks up to me and he pronounces my name correctly. Oh, my God. First of all, Marky Lemons Rowell is hard for a lot of people to get. Right. So when he says to me, are you Marky Lemons Rowell? I start laughing. I said, do you know me because of video? He said, actually, I do. You were my virtual instructor for the Illinois pre-license exam. And uh -huh. I am. And he says, and I am a licensed real estate broker. I said, come on now. I said, so we got to take this picture together. I said, because people need to be reminded about the power of video. Yeah. On the, yeah. On the Chicago South Side, I am a visual celebrity and people know what it is that I do uh -huh. because of the amount of content that I create. Yeah. Now, here's what's funny. I was down in Kentucky, mm -hmm. but the airport is the Kentucky, it's the Cincinnati, Kentucky airport. Yeah. When I'm at the airport, I'm going through the clear line and the gentleman says, you're in real estate. Now I started laughing because I'm in Kentucky, right? I was like, how, what, how you know that? He says, my wife is the past president of the Cincinnati Association of Realtors. Wow. And I know she watches your videos. Wow. The people in line start looking like, and, and who she say she is, right? Because I'm laughing and I'm in awe, okay? Because wow. I knew the power in Chicago, which is actually my biggest market. Sure. I did not understand its power on a national level outside of being at a real estate event. Yeah, it's huge. It's huge. So when you think about leveraging social media, I want that you got to be vulnerable, open up a little bit uh, because people do business with people who they know, like, and trust. Okay. Um, and if you're going to create content, video is the only form of content that you can repurpose without recreating. Yeah, totally agreed. And I love how you talked about like, authentic education versus just like, here's a picture of me looking good because there's no value in that. I think you totally nailed it. You know, I look at images all day long, 
of properties. <laughs> I look at images of, you know, uh, real staging, virtual staging, properties for sale, distressed properties, um, new construction plans. And all day long, I see that juxtaposed with these, what did you call it? The Gucci bag photos that are complete garbage, right? So it's like images in my head that I can't get rid of. And I see zero value in even, and I'll even argue bad property marketing and the Gucci bag, you know, incidents of um, every year, every month, every day that I see them. That's not telling anyone anything that's equitable for them. I know for a lot of people, regardless of industry, they view that as people will see me as successful and therefore they will know, like, and trust me. And you nailed it. It is the opposite of what most people are kind of presenting right now is what most others are looking for. People are looking for authenticity. They're looking for actual education, um, not edutainment. <laughs> and I think it's incredibly important now more than ever, as this industry is going through the highest highs of my career. And also, you know, depending on who you talk to, we will eventually see corrections and lows. It doesn't matter what happens to the market if your brand has no value, if you have no true passion for educating people. And I think that's where you get it right, Marquis. I mean, you have a lot of fun with education, but you make sure that it's truly something that people can take away from and feel fulfilled by. And it's not just a self-fulfilling prophecy, a feeling good, looking good, and playing a part. I mean, it's, it's really admirable what you're doing. And I love that you actually help other agents to do it. Would you mind telling us a little bit about that, about your program? So I do have the six figures in 12 months, but I also want to say before the six figures in 12 months, I have the only digital lead generation program in the realtor family. So nice. I have my, I have two certificate programs, Love it. one in conjunction with the Real Estate Business Institute, the other one in conjunction with the Women's Council. Both of those were created in the midst of the pandemic. So, and I'm a part of their LMS, their uh, learning management system. Yeah. So I'm creating content with the most visible organizations in the world. I did have a contract with homes.com. Uh, before they were acquired by CoStar, I was their secret speaker for two years, traveling the country, educating realtors, wow. and the MLS would not partner with them if it did not have education value. Good. With that being said, in the midst of the pandemic, we did birth six figures in 12 months. Wow. It is a monthly membership where every single month I provide a master class, I provide one group coaching session, I preview my podcast so that the members can have Q&A uh, with these national icons that I interview. Ooh. We provide them with a weekly tutorial and or a Canva template. And then once a month, we have a competition for a member to win what is called the hot seat. And the hot seat puts me in the hot seat for one hour Q&A with that person to ask me anything that their heart desires. Wow. And let me tell you something, they be setting my butt on fire. <laughs> um, and no one has asked the same question twice. They come wow. prepared with their long list of questions. So they, they value it because it is a one hour consultation, but they have to be willing to record that to the public. And what I do is take it and repurpose it. Yeah. So that means they're getting an email, a blog post, two videos on YouTube, podcasts indicated to what, three, 400 different platforms because they won the hot seat. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it's been a great success. Um, it, it superseded our expectations by almost 30% when we launched wow. and we're coming up on our one year anniversary. And now we have an entirely new program, uh, not new, but it's new price and everything. Uh, but we have uh, 760 members and 600 and something were founding members. Wow. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's very wow. exciting. Had very a exciting. That's practicing what you preach right there. Yeah. And we did a town hall meeting where they had the opportunity to tell me what they they think that they need. And what came out of that was the fact that I need to do a face to face regional event. So I've picked four locations for 2022 and I am going to do a regional meetup. And I'm going to do it in conjunction with another event. So I'm doing the Association Executive Institute in Atlanta. I'm going to do an Atlanta event. You always go to Vegas at least one time a year. Vegas, yeah, Vegas, I'm Vegas, here. Like, so that's where yes, we are. <laughs> yes. And then uh, I'm going to do one in the D.C., the DMV area, 
uh, at our legislative meetings and then one in Chicago. So that was something that came out and that we do a regional mastermind. So basic because each region has different unique issues. So true. So um, I think that all real estate is local. All business is local. So every region is so different. Every region. So those were some of the things that they said that they wanted. I said, OK, not a problem. Let's put it together. That's super cool. Do you think, you know, final thoughts from you, do you think it's an either or question for most agents? Like we work with a lot of luxury realtors simply because the margins in luxury real estate kind of rely itself for more sales and marketing focus, right? Do you think that um, the future of being not only a top performing realtor, even if you're not, let's say like you and super education focused, um, is it more so hinged on personal brand or is it on better property marketing? If you had to choose one, I could guess where you're at, but you actually gave some great examples for both where it was like, I invest in what is important to me and important to my services, but I also invest in myself and my brand. Do you think the average realtor, regardless of if they have you know, a luxury status or a, you know, a top performing designation, should they focus on one or the other? Or is what I'm hearing from you is that both can be successful with the right strategy, the right value proposition and the right investment and vision? So I don't think I think it should be one. Uh, so I think that you should have a brand and that you market your properties under that brand so Got that it. when people see your properties and they see you. They yeah. instantly know that that is your listing. So one thing that I did earlier this year, my my colors are red and black yeah. for a couple of reasons. Red is my favorite color and my sorority colors are red and white. Well, I realized that those are very strong colors, yeah. especially when coupled together. And I also realized that my audience is 70 percent female with the number one age bracket being 45 to 54. Yeah. So instantly I'm like, girl, you got to soften this brand up because it's too strong yeah. for who you're attracting. And the designer did something real simple. <laughs> she put a lot of white space and used red and black as an accent color. Yeah. Right. And, and I'm looking like, I'm like, oh, that was freaking genius. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and cursives. I like that there's a little bit of extra cursives on yeah. your name brand, that kind of stuff. So it's my cool. name is in cursive. And yeah. because the age bracket is 45 to 54, the rest is kind of like uh, a bold font yeah. so that they can read right because a lot of us over the age of 40 have readers right so what I would say is but people know my brand that my colors have been consistent since oh probably 1990 okay which is why I was not willing to change my colors but Mm -hmm. I wanted to to change the perception of the colors right Mm -hmm. and so people expect great marketing from Marky agreed What I don't agree with is the realtor who goes and has all these wonderful photo shoots done of themselves. Yep. But their property marketing is horrible. Girl, preach. Say that three times. I could not agree more. Oh, their pictures are fabulous. But then when that homeowner, think about that, that homeowner how disgruntled they are Yes, when they see that you did not invest the same so type true. of time and energy so, so true. into marketing their listing as you did yourself. Yeah. So if you're going to do that, and this is my recommendation, once a year, once every two years, get a big photo shoot done, yeah. right? Take, and I have like three, 400 photos, do the upper uh, one third to the left one third, mm-hmm. you know, so you can do all your fun pictures, your pointing yeah. and all that, right? But then take the rest of that money that you were doing all these great photo shoots yeah. with and hire a professional photographer and then go and do this. Remove the background of one of these great pictures and yeah. put yourself on everything because now, right, this is a two for one. You're yeah. consistently branding yourself with the property. Ooh. But I don't and I don't know why. It, look. I'm, I had never verbally said that to anybody, but I don't know what's so hard to figure out about that. Listen, to me, that's, that's the good. entrepreneurship side of it, right? That is absolutely the, the business owner thought process instead of just, you know, I do some real estate on the side. It's really the difference there. I see very clearly like your boss techniques come so naturally for you because you're constantly looking at this from a professional lens 
instead of a hobby lens. Cause that makes perfect sense to me. Like take your personal brand that you're so in love with, right. That you're so excited about and apply it to your property marketing. It's not only more efficient and more cost-effective, but it makes good sense for your clients. So everybody wins in that scenario that you just gave. And your clients, guess what? They're going to like the marketing because it's going to be professional photos, right. right? And here's another idea right now. Because of Canva, I have a virtual assistant that works exclusively in Canva. Mm -hmm. Put together a marketing photo for every property and share it with that seller only because most of them have a free Canva account also. Yeah. So then they can share the marketing as well, especially if you have an exclusive right to sell agreement, because all mm -hmm. transactions would have to come back through you anyway. Yep. I love that. Yeah, that is so true. I, I think Canva, Sunny, you're, you mentioned Canva. And so I, my background was always in sales and marketing. So my entire career, I remember when Canva came out and I think my mind exploded. Like the idea of always having like in big businesses that I worked for, you know, for pretty large multinational companies, we had like a marketing team, we had graphic designers, we had all the bells and whistles that people like think that they need to be successful that now in this world that we're living in now, you could be so scrappy and just as successful. And I remember when Canva came in and I thought, how did we take something that was always for experts, right? Always extra cost and high cost at that. And we democratized that thing to anyone and everyone that wanted to be smart about brand and marketing. Like it was probably, I'm going to be very hyperbolic for a second and say it was one of the biggest inventions that have added to our professional careers as marketers and salespeople more than almost anything except for maybe social media and the internet. Like it has democratized brand and visuals in a way that I don't know anything else has, right? Because now to your point, even your clients, your sellers have access to Canva and you can help them to help you sell this damn property. I mean, that's huge. That wasn't even around 10, 15 years ago. That wasn't even possible. And each design is a standalone web page. I mean, let me don't, don't even let me get started with the, the value of Canva in your business, right? Yeah. Um, but it changed everything. And yeah. so their CEO and her team are phenomenal. Yeah. Look, I remember when it came out and now it has a multi-billion dollar valuation. Oh. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a phenomenal tool. So every realtor, you need a Canva. You need a Canva you need account. Canva. And you need to use it for, gosh, Marquis, you freaking nailed it. You need to use it for more than just cute pictures of yourself. No one cares about that if you can't sell their home. <laughs> no one cares about that if you don't truly know your market and know how to figure out what's best for your clients and represent them well. So I just love your passion for being both brand savvy and great at your property marketing because I really believe that it's the thing that, and this is where I say, regardless of if you're a luxury realtor, you're just starting out, or you work in every element of the market, this is important. And I think these days, it's often foreseen as, well, I only work with you know clients of a certain type or properties of a certain number. And so that's why I should focus on brand and I should care about better property marketing. And to your point, the client of today, some statistics that have recently come out, and I think it actually was from National Association of Realtors, that talked about the fact that, listen, your client um, that are looking at a property or looking at information about you, first of all, they don't read the way they used to. They're looking at your image. They're looking at your likeness and they're looking at whatever it is you put out as part of your brand and they're judging you off of that. And so why not focus on the thing that we know actually makes a difference right now. Video is number one. You nailed that. And also just the overall aesthetic, whether you're representing yourself or you're representing a property. I think it's such a holistic approach to sales and marketing. It's not just about what you say and what you do, you know, off camera, but it really is something that I can see you live and breathe in your brand every single day. Thank you so much for sharing some of your wisdom today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate sharing. We got to do it again. This was too good. And you dropped some truth bombs you said you'd never done again. So I know we got good stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah. We, we, look, some of that stuff I have never publicly said, but you got it today. Wow. Okay.